how do you record you Wow. Einstein once said, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. Curiosity and intellectual hunger led humankind to groundbreaking discoveries in science, such as radiation phenomena, novel cancer therapies, and gravitational waves, as well as technological advancements, including the, the invention of the World Wide Web the development of deep neural networks that became a critical component of computing, and the popularization of robotics, all of which has completely revolutionized industries and been supporting human needs. Such discoveries push humankind forward to a better tomorrow with more understanding of the world surrounding us. Welcome to the NYU Tandon School of Engineering and our latest seminar in what has proven to be an important and informative series targeting the goal of unifying scientific communities around the influential research ideas of today that can have impact tomorrow. The series aims to bring together researchers and students to discuss recent advances in artificial intelligence and related fields. We hope that the scientific discussions that result will contribute to building a better tomorrow and promote groundbreaking discoveries in science. I would like to thank Dean Yelena Kovacevic for her utmost support, as well as my own Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering for hosting this series, which is evolving into a significant venue. When I first conceived of this series, I hoped that I would be able to attract highly esteemed speakers doing revolutionary work in their respective fields. I say with some humility that I have succeeded beyond my wildest dreams. The NYU Tandon seminar series on modern AI launched seven years ago with a talk delivered by Turing Award winner, Jan Lacan, who is sitting today with us in the audience. On the podium today, the 35th speaker of our seminar series is standing with me, J. Andrew Bagnell. Drew earned his undergraduate degree with highest honors in electrical engineering at the University of Florida before entering Carnegie Mellon University as an NSF graduate fellow, and he earned his doctoral degree in robotics there in 2004. That year, he joined Carnegie Mellon's faculty, and he now serves as a consulting professor. It occurs to me that 2024 marks his 20th year there, so happy anniversary, Thank Drew. You. It has been a very distinguished tenure thus far. Drew was a recipient of the university's Ryan Award for meritorious teaching, and he was the founding director of the Robotics Institute Summer Scholars Program, a summer research experience that has enriched hundreds of undergraduates throughout the world. Bagnas Group has received over a dozen research awards for publications in both the robotics and machine learning communities, including best paper awards at ICML, RSS, and ICRA. As a member of Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute, he oversees the Learning Artificial Intelligence and Robotics Laboratory, better known as the Lair Lab. Drew was a founding member at Uber's Advanced Technology Group in Pittsburgh, as well as the co-founder and chief scientist of Aurora, where he now works to develop and deliver self-driving technologies safely, broadly, and quickly. I could go on reciting high points of his CV and the many awards and best paper honors he has won but I know we are all eager to hear his presentation, which is intriguingly titled, An Invitation to Imitation. So without further ado, I give you Robot Whisperer, J. Andrew Bagnell. Good, excellent. Uh, thank you, Anna, very much. Um, uh, it is truly an honor to give a talk here at NYU, and um, I have a lot of friends in the audience. Um, I'm out of practice giving kind of academic talks, so hopefully it will, will not live up to the standard of the first of the seminar series, and I promise nothing on gravitational waves. Um, however, I will talk to you a little bit about imitation learning um, and this general idea that many problems, in my view, in AI are better thought of as imitation learning problems rather than what's traditionally thought of as supervised learning problems. And I'll take you through a little bit about what I mean of that. Um, and this summarizes uh, and literally takes slides from something like a decade or a decade and a half of work. Um, so you'll see slides in all kinds of different formats. Very lucky. Um, I'll start by uh, observing 
Uh, Anna said that I spend my time, my day job now, very relaxing music, um, working on self-driving, particularly on self-driving trucks. Um, this is a video just to give you some ideas of um, self-driving scenario. Um, there's a self-driving truck in the middle of the scene. Um, all of the little blue boxes are vehicles that the self-driving truck has identified out in the environment. And you can see in the background, the LiDAR point cloud. Um, and I just give you this to show you the kind of problems that we deal with at Aurora, um, driving vehicles from point A to point B, where point A and point B might be separated by 11 hours of driving. Let me give you perspective. Um, so these are kind of long haul routes. Um, Imitation learning is actually particularly relevant to the self-driving regime. Um, why? Basically because people who are well-trained and attentive are actually excellent drivers. The fundamental issue is it's very hard to be attentive all the time on an 11 hour drive. Um, and so this is a place where we can take advantage of human expertise to build AIs that can drive uh, as well or better than humans, um, in particular by being attentive all the time. So again, that was just to kind of give you a flavor and set up the kind of problems that imitation learning applies to. Lots of other vehicles on the road. Uh, when I think about imitation learning, the first paper I think of, um, and maybe the original imitation learning uh, paper is Dean Palmerloo's paper uh, in NeurIPS, he was 89, uh, the Autonomous Land Vehicle in a Neural Network. And uh, what Dean did is he built a neural network that would take a camera image, a very crude camera image, and learn to steer like him. So it would learn by demonstration from him how to steer the vehicle, given the camera image's input. Um, what's interesting is uh, Dean, and, and he drove this, in fact, across the United States, a very impressive project. Um, Dean observed immediately that there were differences between traditional supervised learning, where you're doing kind of pattern recognition problem, and the imitation learning problem. Um, and I'll take you through how that shows up. But the kind of crudest idea I want you to think in your head is that standard supervised learning setting is different than the imitation learning setting. And the big difference is in supervised learning, we typically imagine that the decisions of the output of our supervised learner don't affect the inputs. So we think about independent or identically distributed inputs with no effect between learner's outputs and learner's inputs. Um, and so in ML, that, that is not what happens in imitation learning because for instance, the way you steer the vehicle will determine what next camera image you see. And the result is that our test and train distributions won't match, will violate the kind of standard machine learning. In a robotics language, you might say that errors tend to feedback and compound over time. That's the kind of, that's the kind of characteristic difference in imitation learning. Um, there's another thing which is interesting is that actions tend to be purposeful in a sense. So they tend to be sequential decisions that are sequenced over time to lead to some outcome. And you see this in other areas of AI. So for instance, in large language models, they're producing tokens, one token at a time, in order to produce some coherent set of text. Right? And the tokens that they are feeding back to themselves are ones that they themselves produced earlier. So these also have this flavor, any autoregressive model also has this flavor of feeding back its own decisions and changing its own inputs. Um, and so I alluded to this already, it turns out that problems that I would think of as imitation learning show up in lots of different domains. They show up kind of clearly in self-driving. They show up in recommender systems where the recommendations that a learner makes affects what future decisions it gets from the humans it interacts with. They show up in large language models in kind of two ways, the way I alluded to before, the autoregressive nature of the tokens it produces or tokens it consumes, but also that it typically is interacting with a human and there's interaction through that as well. Okay. So I wanna just set up the problem, if you haven't seen it before, of imitation learning and its difference with uh, traditional supervised learning. And the simplest version I know is um, of this is due to uh, Stefan Ross, a student of mine quite a while ago, um, and has been at Waymo working on self-driving uh, for at least a decade now. Um, and he mocked up Dean's uh, real world demo by taking a video game, video driving game, taking images from the video driving game, and steering the vehicle himself, and then showing what happens if you try to apply supervised learners to this setting. Okay, and so the supervised learning approach to this problem is you take expert trajectories driving around a track or multiple tracks in the video game, you get camera images, you get Stefan's steering angle, what Stefan thought you should drive, um, it was really a game controller to get the idea. Um, you apply your favorite supervised learning algorithm, caricature here is um, linear regression, and you output a learned policy. 
Um, and so it turns out, as Dean observed in um, his Derp's paper from a long time ago, this doesn't work very well. Uh, even though Stefan never falls off the track when he drives it, Stefan got pretty good at Super Tux Racer, um, the learned algorithm often does fall off the track. Okay. And you might ask why. Why does this behavior happen? So we wait again. The learner will eventually fall off the track and get poor performance. And again, the real, the real point here is that the predictions of the learner affect its own inputs, its own observations. And what happens is the learner typically makes some small errors, makes some mistakes, doesn't drive exactly like Stefan. It ends up in a position which is different than the learner ended up in. And it may be that the learner has never seen that situation before. That's kind of the extreme version. Or it may just be that those situations are rarely represented. So what Dean observed is that in driving on the road, it would drive straight for a while. It would make a small error. It would kind of get off the center of the lane. And then it would make a series of compounding errors and drive off the road. Right? Obviously, Dean prevented it from driving off the road, but you get the point. OK. And so what we have is, as I said, this violation of the um, identically distributed assumption that our training and test data come from the same distribution. OK, I'm going to use throughout this talk, we'll go into some more details, um, a, crude, a crude idea of your learner is imperfect in what its um, ability to, to do what a human does, to do expert demonstration. And I call that epsilon. And so that's going to be, think of it as the fraction of errors you make in predicting what the human does, right? There's many sources for where this uh, non-realizability could come from. Um, one is the kind of obvious one, it's just insufficient learner capacity. We can build very big models. We can't necessarily build models that are powerful enough to capture everything that humans can do. Um, or we may just have, may not have the compute enough to do that. We may have insufficient samples. So you can think of this epsilon as also being a proxy for, we just don't have enough samples to train the learner as well as we like, and we're always going to have some error. Um, one I'm gonna linger on later is that in lots of interesting applications, the demonstrator actually has access to more information than the learner does. Um, and that can come about from various causes. It come, could come about, for instance, in a self-driving setting, in the humans may see further than the perception system of a self-driving vehicle can. So there can be more information available to the demonstrator than there is to the demonstratee, to the learner. OK. And the observation here is in kind of crude, discrete problems where there's discrete decisions to be made. You would expect in a supervised learning setting, if you make epsilon error at each time step and someone tests you t times, you'll make, in expectation, t epsilon errors. That's what you would expect to happen. Okay, that's not what typically happens in imitation learning problems. Sometimes you're lucky and it does, but often what happens is you see t squared epsilon errors. And the reason's straightforward, there are basically t chances for you to make a mistake. If you make a mistake, you could end up in a situation which is novel to you, and then you could make another order t mistakes thereafter. So you'd expect to see something that's like order t squared epsilon errors when your errors compound and you see things that are unlikely under your distribution training. So I say low training error, it's actually low holdout error. You can have low holdout error, but actually get poor test performance in these imitation learning settings because of this compounding of error. So the question is, can you do better? Turns out there's a bunch of ways to do better. One easy way that I'll describe to do better um, I'll describe now. The basic problem here is we don't have any training data of how to recover from a mistake, right? So Dean in driving that car or Stefan in driving the video game were good enough that they spent very little time in places where the learner needed to learn how to recover. And the learner doesn't know how to recover from mistakes it made. And so the intuitive solution is to, to get some interaction with the environment or interaction with the expert or both. All right, I'm going to talk throughout about a kind of reduction-based approach to machine learning, where you take some harder learning problem and transform it into some easier learning problem. You think about some error rate on that easier learning problem, and then you ask the error rate on that easier learning problem, how does that translate to error on the problem you care about? So in this case, I'm going to think about imitation learning. I'm going to think about a series of supervised learning. I'm going to assume we get performance within epsilon on these supervised learning problems, and then ask what the performance back is. In this case, it's going to be t squared epsilon for the naive algorithm. OK, um, I already said most of that. So here's a very simple algorithm that you might naturally come up with, which looks like, well, first I'm going to run supervised learning, and I'm going to build a policy to drive the vehicle. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive the vehicle with that policy, and I'm going to have the human expert driver actually correct 
the behavior. So every time the learner makes a mistake, I'm going to record what the human driver said it should have done instead. Okay, so the human driver says, you should have driven this way instead. That gets me a new data set, which looks like camera images and, and the preferred steering angle of the human. I'm going to aggregate that together with all the previous data I captured, okay? which before is just supervised learning of the uh, learner driving the vehicle itself. I'm going to learn a new policy on that aggregated data set. Again, your favorite supervised learning algorithm. And then I'm going to do that again and again. So each time, I'm just going to execute my current policy. I'm going to request corrections from the human. I'm going That's going to get me a new data set. I'm going to combine that with the old data set. And I'm going to get a new policy. OK, and so you can imagine doing this in iterations. Yes, Yang. One can solve for making an analogy with the modern way of adjusting LNNs. Sorry, say that again? One, can, one cannot help but make the parallel with the current way of adjusting LNNs. It's human feedback. Uh, yes, and in fact, there are online versions of that, which actually I allude to at the end, um, which seem to do extremely well. And they do well for the same reason, that they're kind of an on-policy version. Um, and so. We could talk about the different algorithms, but agreed, the LLMs are very much moving in this direction. And in fact, there are new LLM training algorithms that are related to the next part too, which is sort of interesting. Okay, so it turns out if you run this enough, you will get the kind of error you would hope in a supervised learning setting. Basically, one of two things has to happen. Either you will fail to learn, fail the supervised learning task, and you won't be able to build a classifier that has epsilon error, or you will eventually learn something that has epsilon error when it executes itself. When it drives the vehicle, it will only disagree with the human epsilon fraction of the time. So you can't be in the in-between situation where you keep getting low errors on your supervised learning problems, but can't successfully drive the car, right? That's the, one of those two things must happen. Okay, so one question that will come up later is, what if we care about performance relative to some reward function? So if you're in sort of a Markov decision process kind of setting, there's some reward function, maybe unknown to you. For instance, the reward function in this case that, that may be unknown to us is that it's bad to drive off the, the edge of the road, right? Or it might be that there's a point score, like in the video game, there's actually a point score that we care about. And we want to compete with the human driver actually on that task, rather than just do we agree with what the human does. Okay, this problem is in general really hard. Without any further assumptions, it's basically impossible. And the reason is I can set up problems um, I would call it a cliff-like problem, where any mistake you make means that you end up in a situation you can't recover from. So for instance, you drive off the road, right? you make one error, you drive off the road, and from then on, you just incur constant costs. Right? This is the, um, all things are bad at that point. So then any one error is gonna lead to bad performance. Okay? There's nothing you can do in those kind of settings. Turns out most problems are not like that. They are recoverable in the sense that small errors can often be mitigated and you can do something else to get back into the situation. So for instance, you could steer a little bit off the road and then steer back to the center of the road. Okay, so we'll introduce a notion of recoverability. What I want you to think about recoverability is if I make one error and then I handed control back to the expert, how much would I pay additionally for having made that one error than if I hadn't made that one error, okay? That thing I'm gonna call R. The worst case of that I'm gonna call R. All right, again, without any further assumptions on R, you can't do better than T squared epsilon. This online algorithm I just described will get within that R, that degree of recoverability, T epsilon, where the supervised learning algorithm will still be T squared epsilon. So it'll be kind of the worst case it can be. So that's the kind of theoretical guarantee. Um, quick aside on why aggregating this data works. Uh, in particular, a number of, of papers tried not aggregating the data together. So they basically just took the data from the most recent execution and human corrections. And it turns out that doesn't work very well. Um, one way to see this, and in fact, this, the, the theoretical bounds I'm describing apply to any algorithm that has what's called a no regret property. And so what this looks like is you can think about a game between two players. One player is the imitation learner itself. And the other is the combination of the world and the expert demonstrator. And the learner basically hands over a policy. The adversary chooses a loss, which is defined by the expert demonstrator and the world itself, the interactions with the world. The learner updates its policy, the adversary chooses a loss. You can think of this as an interactive game. 
And then what you want is learning algorithms that promise to do well in these kind of game theoretic environments. All right, turns out there's lots of algorithms that have this no regret property. Online gradient descent has this no regret property. Um, things that are follow the leader, follow the leader under certain loss functions has this property. With regularization, it typically has this property. Follow the leader means aggregate all your data together as I just described and do well on the aggregate data. Um, you can use any no regret algorithm in these scenarios and you'll get that same T epsilon guarantee I just described. Um, I don't have time to go into details on what no regret means if you're not familiar with it, but I can give you two criteria that are sufficient to imply something is no regret. The two criteria are that as the data set gets very large, the learner is asymptotically consistent, meaning it will achieve the best in the class of learners that you're considering. And the second, second thing it requires is that it be stable, meaning small perturbations to the data set, particularly asymptotically, don't make large changes in the output. If you have those two properties, then you'll be no regret and you'll get these kind of guarantees I'm describing. And again, what doesn't work is just updating based on the last data you collected. Okay. Um, this one's kind of boring, so actually I'm going to skip it because what happens is the vehicle just drives itself around. Yep. Yeah, I'm actually curious about how, how much, first of all, is Dagger uh, scalable? So, or it seems like quite a labor intensive approach. So it is a labor, it is a labor intensive approach. Um, and I'll show you some examples later. And the expert demonstrator will actually not be a human in many of the instances. So it becomes, and I'll show you how that comes up. Um, but I'll talk about the less expert intensive approaches in the next chunk of the talk. Um, uh, bottom line is these algorithms for the, for the same amount of training data work much better than just collecting data from the human. Um, you can tell this is an old school result because the x-axis has a 10 to the fourth in it rather than 10 to the sixth in it or 10 to the eighth. Um, this is what I was alluding to before. So this is a pretty common technique now in uh, robotics. And what often happens, and in fact, all of the pictures I'm showing, is sometimes called learning by cheating. So there is some um, expert demonstrator which takes advantage of privileged information. So it could be, for instance, that in Byron Boot's work, um, they have set up the system in advance so that it has detailed knowledge of where the vehicle is from state estimation. So they've set up you know, detailed tracking of the vehicle, and the vehicle learns to drive first in a uh, with privileged information of its true state, that thing becomes the expert and it trains a vision-based version of the system. Okay. Another version of that, I'll show on the next slide. This is work in Chelsea Finn's group, um, uh, Chris Atkinson as well. Um, they trained a parkour robot uh, in simulation. Um, and so it's a fun video. The robot does all kinds of parkour-like moves. Um, this, this thing was trained entirely in simulation. The training and simulation was done with privileged state information of the map of the world, so to speak, as well as the kinematics of the robot in the world. That was how the policy was trained. That policy, which again, knows exactly what the objects are in the world, knows the joint locations of the robot and the velocities of all the joint locations of the robot, is used to train by this expert demonstration a vision-based version of the same system. Right. So this is how this paper gets around the, you know, how is it expensive? Isn't it very expensive for a human? Well, it's less expensive when the thing training it is not a human. Right. Um, similarly, there's been work um, starting with Hal Delmay was really the innovator here in natural language processing on doing this kind of on policy training. And there are algorithms now that do, um, as Jan alluded to, online AI feedback, where in fact, actually one LLM is training another LLM, uh, usually a smaller LLM. Okay, I want to talk about a different approach to imitation learning at this point. Um, the inverse reinforcement learning or the inverse optimal control approach to imitation learning. And the setup here is what we want to do is assume that the behavior that we're seeing demonstrated right, by the demonstrator is a near optimal behavior in some markup decision process like problem. There's some planning, scheduling, control, optimization task that the behavior we're seeing is nearly optimal for. Okay. And we'll assume we have access to the environment that this is being optimized in. And the thing that we don't know is what is being optimized. Okay, That's the game. So we're, gonna, we're going to claim that the behavior we see is near optimal. We're going to try to figure out what's being optimized. And then we're going to use that to guide the behavior in new settings. 
Um, you can think of this as a kind of move from the from making individual decisions to trajectory space. And what we're going to do is measure our deviations between the expert and the learner in the space of trajectories. Okay, so the first idea you might have is I'm going to find a, dem a cost function that makes the demonstrator optimal. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer that cost function to my learner. And that learner will try to optimize that cost function, maybe in new problem settings, and be able to predict what to do. That sounds like a good idea. But it's not quite right. And the reason is, is because there are lots of degenerate solutions. One of the trivial degenerate solutions, for instance, in a planning problem of getting robot from point A to point B, is if I just set all the costs to zero, all behaviors are optimal. So if I can always say, hey, the trivial solution of zero is a, is a valid solution to the problem as I just described it. Therefore, I can produce any behavior I want. And I haven't learned anything interesting. The refined version of that is I want to find a policy so that all cost functions in some set of cost functions I'm considering, the behavior is as good as the demonstrator. So whatever cost function the demonstrator is actually optimizing, I'm going to compete with the um, demonstrated expert on that cost function. Okay, so you can think of this as a constraint, which is the cost of the demonstrator is going to equal the cost of the Im imitator for all cost functions that we're considering. Um, for a linear space of cost functions, by that I don't mean linear in the inputs, I mean I can add two cost functions together and get a new cost function, which is also a valid cost function. For a linear space of cost functions, this is equivalent to moment matching. What it basically says is whatever moments that make up my, whatever moments can define my cost functions, uh, basis vectors for my cost functions, I better get the same moments as the expert on those. Okay, which, the gradient, I'm not going to write down the, the loss function, but for a very common variant of these kind of inverse reinforcement learning, the gradient of the loss that you end up optimizing looks like the difference in expectations of the current best guess of the cost function under the learner's policy minus the expectation under the expert's, the demonstrator's policy. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my cost function so as to keep Optimizing that. OK, as I said, this is effectively moment matching. Um, it turns out if the, behavior, if the behavior that I demonstrate is not actually optimal, so the demonstrator makes some errors, they're imperfect. In general, I'm not going to be able to find an optimal policy that gets the exact same behavior as the, as the expert demonstration. OK? So, what I have to actually do is I have to create a stochastic policy, which is kind of near optimal. So that's one way to get a stochastic policy. There are many mixtures that do this. Turns out the one of the simplest ways to do this is to, to claim I'm going to get the same moments, the same cost function as the expert. But in doing so, I'm also going to try to optimize entropy. I'm going to try to find the thing with the highest entropy that also matches the cost function or any cost function I can provide, matches the performance. OK, when you look at the resulting gradient of the loss function, it looks very much like things you may be familiar with, like a GAN. It's a two-part system. There's one part, which is the generator, which is the, um, the policy. You can either think of this or this as the policy. It doesn't matter. They're symmetric, um, which is generating samples according to my current policy. And then I have a cost function that discriminates between the learner and the expert. So I've got a current guess of the learner and I've got demonstrations from my expert, which are fixed. They're not, they're not being iterated. And what I'm going to do is try to find the cost function that maximally discriminates those things. And then what I'm going to do is change my policy to try to optimize that cost function further. And you keep doing this again and again, try to find the thing that's maximally discriminative, update your policy, so that it, it is as good as the expert on that current cost function. And you iterate this. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about this kind of taxonomy of imitation learning algorithms. The pure supervised learning approach, I would call behavioral cloning. So you're gathering data from expert demonstrations and measuring your divergence in action space of the, um, the learner itself.
I just described the inverse reinforcement learning approach where you're generating full trajectories through the space of the system and you're measuring the divergence between those trajectories by a cost function. And then you're trying to find a policy that minimizes that cost function. And then there is the last approach I described where you assume you have further access that there's some expert that will not will actually tell you what to do if you end up in some particular state. And that's the kind of taxonomy of imitation, imitation learning approaches. Okay. You could think of this as a game. I'll skip the details of that. In the interest of time, I will skip the details of these. Um, this is actually a robot that I worked on with Larry years ago. Um, and in fact, it was trained by these inverse optimal control techniques. And the idea, the idea qualitatively is very simple for how these algorithms work. Basically, you look at all the places that the learner wants to go now that the human demonstration didn't want to go. And any place the learner wants to go that the demonstrator didn't go, you say, hey, that should be more expensive. Anywhere that the demonstrator goes that the learner didn't go, you should say, hey, that should be cheaper. Okay? And then you adjust your cost function in that direction. And then you run and find the optimal policy again for that. And that's how many of the robots that drive outdoors were designed. This is an example. Oops. Of what learning from overhead sensor data looks. So it starts out guessing a straight line path. It slowly changes its interpretation of this overhead image I just showed you until it agrees with the initial demonstration of the human. And all it's doing is changing a cost. The brighter the color is in that black and white map, the higher the cost is in that particular region. Okay, so an interesting result, I think, is that IRL has one core advantage that was mentioned earlier, which is that it doesn't require interactive querying of the expert. It just has one set of trajectories drawn from the expert. But it also can learn policies that the interactive expert cannot. I'm gonna briefly give you an idea of where that shows up. So imagine that you have, again, a robot that inevitably makes some mistakes. So a learner makes some small fraction of mistakes, okay? But the demonstrator does not. The demonstrator can act perfectly. The demonstrator may choose a path from start to goal that walks along a narrow path where any mistake leads to it falling off a cliff, right? And bad outcomes to occur. Okay, there may be a slightly more expensive route around the world, which avoids this very low recoverability situation. The imitation learning expert, the imitation learning algorithms that query the expert will never find this. And the reason they'll never find this is the human says, do this at the first time step, and the robot will do this at the first time step. And then the human says, do this at the next time step, and the robot will do this at the next time step. And so it is led down the garden path. And again, if it inevitably makes mistakes, it's going to be forced to fall off. The algorithms that just try to do as well or close to as well as the human on whatever cost function they're learning will eventually determine that when they do this, bad things happen and it's really high cost. And if they go around, they can't quite match the moments of the human because they incur a longer distance, but that, the, that is the closest they can get to matching moments. So they'll have the smallest divergence between the learner and the expert. Okay. Um, this is recent work with Wen Sun and my student Gokul Swami. There's a bunch of math, but the bottom line is you can prove a recoverability bound for these IRL algorithms just like you can for the interactive expert algorithms. So you don't need an interactive expert to get a bound which looks like I do nearly as well as the expert plus something which scales with the horizon length of the problem and how this epsilon, this crude idea of I'm going to make mistakes, I'm going to make some small number of mistakes, and inevitably, there's this recoverability idea. If I can't, if any mistake I make is fatal, then I can't possibly do better than T squared. Okay. So I like that because you can show now that the IRL algorithms also have this non compounding of errors behavior. Okay. The IRL approach, we just talked about a number of its advantages. Um, another thing that's particularly cool about IRL based approaches is they can do zero shot learning in the sense that you learn a cost function in this process. And now you can, for a new goal, you tell your robot, here's a new goal. You can say, hey, go optimize that cost function. And now the robot can go to a new goal. That's very hard if you're just trying to learn a policy directly. Right? It's very hard to change the goal of the policy. Um, you often get reduced sample complexity too, because it's often easier to describe the cost function than it is to describe the behavior. 
So often you get less, you need fewer samples to actually learn the behavior. You may need a lot of samples to figure out what the optimal policy is, but that's typically done in some kind of simulation and doesn't involve the human, human demonstrator. Okay. Um, we alluded to this earlier. Yeah. It's perhaps an argument that uh, uh, the way uh, evolution hardwires behavior in uh, animals is not by actually hardwiring, be hardwiring behavior, but by hardwiring the objective function. It could be. Yeah. So yeah. Um, my guess is it probably does both to varying degrees, right? Because I think some behaviors are indeed sort of scripted, right? But I think you're right. I think it's probably much easier to program in what you're trying to accomplish than how to accomplish it. Right? I agree with that. Um, this, this idea has been applied in a variety of different domains. One that I think is particularly interesting um, that I was alluding to earlier when I was talking to Jan was um, you can see the same flavor of idea in some recent LLM training algorithms where the LLM training algorithms are actually generating data from the current model and trying to discriminate that from text generated by humans. And they're updating implicitly a cost function using what I would call the DPO trick to figure out how to get a policy that then optimizes that cost function. Um, so you see the flavor of inverse reinforcement learning in some recent LLM papers as well. Okay, I wanna linger a bit because it's particularly relevant, although I might go quickly over this, on the incomplete information source of error. Because I think this is a particularly common source of error. Um, meaning this, this epsilon I routinely come back to, is that there's some error that your learner makes. So a really simple problem that comes up in self-driving, I'll give you a very crude version of it, is you have to decide whether or not to apply the brakes. Okay? Um, so think about it as a really simple, like the Dean Pomerleau case, but there's some neuron that's going to output how much to brake the vehicle. And you can put in two inputs. So one input you might put in is sensor data, like does the car, is the car in front of you slowing down? or does it have its brake lights on, okay? You can also put in information which is, is the vehicle currently braking, okay? That turns out to be useful because you often want behavior that's kind of smooth over time, right? So you don't want kind of jerky behavior where it goes on and off the brakes. Um, it's been observed that in very simple cases, if you train by supervised learning um, a setup like this, you will often get the behavior that the learner basically ignores the perceptual sensor data and just decides to brake if it's currently braking. So if the vehicle is not braking, it won't brake. And then once it starts braking, it will just continue to brake, right? Um, the, the paper we were alluding to earlier, paper by uh, uh, Erz and Jan years ago on the Dave robot system. So Dave was a... a small robot that was designed to wander around the world and avoid obstacles, trained by human demonstration. Okay, and the paper observes this point that I thought was really interesting and bears directly on this, which is, it was a convolutional neural network. They can tell you much more details about it, but it was a convolutional neural network trained by human demonstration. And I think it worked quite well if you were taking a pair of camera frames so that you'd get stereo information, um, one from each eye, and you had it map that to how to drive. Okay. The interesting result is if you put in multiple frames, meaning time sequence of frames, the observation was the vehicle would drive for some period of time, and then it would apparently start turning, and then it would continue turning. Right? And again, I think this is the same phenomenon where it begins relying more on the fact that it is turning to determine that it should turn. Okay? Um, this problem is sufficiently well known in the self-driving literature that it actually has a name. It's the inertia problem. Now, I think the phrase inertia is just due to the fact that like literally the robot will stop and then will not want to go again, right? It's on the brakes, so it continues to be on the brakes. But in general, this repeating the same output again and again is a common problem. Um, you can think of this as a covariate shift problem. You'll see this problem, again, if you force an epsilon error, there's always some unavoidable epsilon error. You will see this problem. Basically, there's a giant covariate shift and the algorithms will just ignore anything except the really obvious predictor, the uh, you know, the brake is currently being pressed, right? Or the vehicle is currently spinning. But I think often this problem is actually caused by hidden contextual information. So I want you to think about situations right now where a human has some additional information, which I'll call a context, that the learner does not have, but that that information will be revealed over time. So again, think about 
the human can perceive things further than the robot can. That would be one version of this. Um, it's very much like these robot setups, like the parkour setup, where the expert demonstrator there has access to the complete state of the world, including the complete map, but the learner only has perceptual information. Right? So there's more information available to the demonstrator than the learner. That's the situation I want you to consider. Okay, so now what I want you to think about is policies that are based on sequences of states and actions that are chosen in the past, rather than just the current state and action. Okay, um, there was a nice paper from DeepMind group called Shaking the Foundations, where they observed the inertia problem in large language models as well, which I think is quite interesting, where they'd find either the model would repeat itself or that it would spit out nonsense when prompted certain ways, which I thought was interesting. And so they gave this example problem to try to get to the kind of essence of what's the simplest uh, example of showing this kind of um, inertia behavior. And the example they gave is really, really simple. Imagine a bandit problem. So there's three arms you can pull, okay? One of those arms will get you reward. The other two will not. Okay. The expert demonstrator gets to know which arm has the reward, okay? The learner only gets to see the sequences of pulls, okay? So the learner is just always gonna pull the correct arm. Right, that's the, the game. So I say the learner, the expert's always going to just pull the correct arm, and the learner has to learn which arm to pull. Okay. And think about it as the initial setup is randomized as to which arm contains the reward and the other arms do not. All right, then I want you to think about two parameters that describe the problem. There's actually three parameters that describe this problem. There's the number of arms, right? So think about K arms, I'll use five in the discussion later. And then there's two parameters which are noise parameters. One is the expert is shaky. It doesn't always make the optimal decision. So think about it as 10% of the time, it'll choose the wrong arm. Okay? That's actually important because otherwise you would never see the expert choose the wrong arm. And from a supervised learning point of view, you're totally hosed, right? You'd always just see the expert magically chooses the right arm and you never know what to do in any other situation. The other thing I want you to consider is that there's observation noise. So there's a small amount of noise which flips the whether or not what you see is the correct arm or the incorrect arm, okay? Meaning whether it gets reward or not. Okay. So it's two parameters to the problem. Okay, and so you see data like wrong arm, wrong arm, wrong arm, wrong arm, right arm. This is what the learner sees. Remember, the expert sees that is the correct arm, right? That is the arm with reward. Okay, what you see, if you look at this problem space, I find pretty interesting. If you've got, this is the observation noise. This is the shaky hand noise, okay? If you get 50% observation noise, the problem is insoluble because you have no idea what the right arm is. The, it's always 50-50 whether or not you get reward independent of the, which arm you pull. So there's nothing you can do. You can't win in that case. Okay, I'm gonna plot with a green dot with whether the algorithm achieves asymptotically the optimal reward. Meaning as T gets very large, it pulls the correct arm effectively infinitely often. Okay, and I'm gonna plot with a red dot whether or not asymptotically it pulls the wrong arm, right? If it gets the, it does not achieve the optimal reward. What I find interesting about this problem is if you train this on policy, meaning the learner gets to pull an arm and then the expert says what you should have done, right? You'll find that the learner will learn to, on its own execution, effectively try the various arms, figure out which one the best one is, and keep pulling that. Okay. And it will learn that for basically all parameters of this problem. The one that does just straight supervised learning on expert demonstrations of this behavior shows what looks like a super sharp phase transition. So in places where the observation noise is... Actually, let's think about the shaky hand noise. Where the shaky hand noise is high, so there's a lot of exploration in the problem, it will learn the optimal policy. It will learn that I need to try a bunch of the arms, and then I will figure out what the best arm is. When the shaky hand noise is low, what happens is the learner mistakes its own action for the action chosen by the expert. And so what it does is it picks an arm at random the first time, and then it just does that from then on. So it says whether or not it gets reward, right? It just picks that one from then on. And, and this is truly a phase transition. It looks like you get optimal reward at green dot and a tiny change in the parameter space and the supervised learning algorithm falls apart and gets the worst possible reward, which I find pretty interesting. Um, that's what it looks like if you think about it as a plot. The on policy learner 
pretty quickly learns to get the near optimal reward. It's not 1.0 because of the shaky hand property of the problem. Um, the supervised learner never learns to succeed in this kind of problem. Okay, so this is a general property of problems where there's some hidden state that the learner doesn't have access to, but that as it gathers more information, it can more and more closely approximate the behavior of the expert. As you see this behavior where supervised learning algorithms are suboptimal and always kind of boundedly suboptimal, and on policy algorithms will actually not do this inertia thing, which I think is particularly interesting. It's also true of the inverse reinforcement learning algorithms. So if you've got hidden context and you've got a learner that as it gathers more information gets better and better, offline imitation learning will fail and online imitation learning will succeed. And I already alluded to why. Um, I gave a very toy problem that was given in the LLM community, but it's true uh, more generally. Basically any problem where you hide some state and you apply supervised learning, you often get worse results if you put more history in, where if you train on policy, like with the expert corrections, then as you add more history, the learner often gets better. You can see that in this plot. The, uh, you can see that the learner gets better and better. It's not the case often if you add history to a supervised learning algorithm. And again, I think it's because it often just cheats and tries to use that history to make its predictions, like the breaking example I gave. Okay, so if you add history, and you train on policy, you'll get good results. Okay, the last thing on the new things I wanna talk about is making IRL fast, this inverse reinforcement learning approach. Because there's something that should really bother you about the inverse reinforcement learning approach to imitation learning. The thing that should really bother you is I took a problem of arguably medium complexity, right? So if you think about supervised learning as one of the easier problems, and you think of reinforcement learning as a hard problem, imitation learning somewhere in between, because you affect your inputs, but someone's telling you what the right answer is in a sense, right? You don't have to go figure out what the right answer is on your own. And we turned the problem of imitation learning into a series of harder problems, solve a bunch of reinforcement learning problems as I vary the cost function to try to maximally discriminate between the learner and the demonstrator. So this sounds bad. I've taken medium complexity problem and turned it into lots of hard problems, okay? So what can I do to get around that? Okay, so first, why is this reinforcement learning problem that I keep using as an oracle hard? It, there's a very simple way to understand why it's hard, and that is basically because of global exploration. So think about a decision-making problem where it's just a binary decision-making problem at each step. You have to choose right or left at each step, okay? And think about a depth T or depth H. I think this slide will use H, meaning I'm going to make H decisions along the way. Okay, well, the reward could be anywhere. I could set up a problem where the reward is anywhere in these leaves. Okay. So for instance, it's right there. Then if I don't have any other information and I only have sample access to the environment, I need an exponential in H number of samples to ever find any reward, right? So I'm just gonna have to try all possible actions available to me before I even see that there's a reward out there to be had. This is what makes reinforcement learning, is one of the things that makes reinforcement learning hard, is I could be stuck doing global exploration, and I could be stuck doing global exploration in something that grows exponentially in time, which is not great. Okay. You'll note, however, that I have access to a particularly important source of information that I've basically totally ignored, which is I have access from the expert demonstrator of where a really good policy goes which is not used in the inverse reinforcement learning. It's used to train the discriminator to discriminate between the learned policy and the expert. I use the expert demonstrations for that, but for the inner loop of find the optimal policy for this proposed reward function, it doesn't get used at all. And that should strike you as counterintuitive and that I've thrown away some piece of information. Okay, so the key thing I want you to observe is I want to take advantage of the fact that I know where a good policy goes in this tree because I see the expert demonstrator choose this path through the tree. Okay. Or if the optimal reward is here, I see it use that path through the tree. Okay, how can I take advantage of that? How do I reduce that exploration? Okay, what I'm going to do is use the expert demonstrations in the policy search procedure of reinforcement learning rather than just in the discriminator learning step. And how can I do that? Let me describe two ways to do that. 
One, expert resets, and second, hybrid training. Let me describe each of those to you. The expert resets idea is super simple. Um, you can prove results for these algorithms, but for very specific versions of these algorithms. I'm gonna tell you practically what to do, and we could talk about the theoretical versions of the algorithms that are actually perfectly correct. For the expert reset case, all we do is we start, normally we start at some start state, and we look at what the expert does from that start state, and we look at what our current policy does from that start state, and then we measure the divergence of these, and we try to make the policy optimize as well as it can the current cost function. Okay, what I'm going to do is not just start from the start state, but I'm going to start the learner from the start state, but also from states along the expert's sample demonstrations. So note this presumes that I have a simulation where I can restart the learner in any state that I would like. Okay, but then I'm going to just run my reinforcement learning algorithm with, instead of always starting at the start state, I'm going to start a fraction of the time from the expert demonstration states along its path. And then the learner gets to understand how to do well at the end of the trajectory of the expert demonstrator. And then you can think about a kind of dynamic programming. Once it knows how to do that, well, then it can learn how to do well from one step back. And then it can learn how to do well from one step back. And then it can learn to do well from one further step back. It never needs to explore the whole tree because it learns from the expert which of the paths along the tree actually matter. Okay, and so literally all we're doing is changing the start state distribution. Okay, and then we get a fast reinforcement learning algorithm. It will not return the optimal policy. It will return something which is competitive with the demonstration policy. And it turns out that's actually all you need to prove inverse reinforcement learning works. You don't need at every step to return an optimal policy for the cost function you're given. You need to return a policy that's as good as the demonstrator is on that cost function, which is a key difference. You don't, you don't actually have to find the globally optimal policy, just something that's as good as the expert. There's another way to do this. So if you think about, if you think about, consider the situation where you don't have the ability to reset your simulator to a particular state. Okay. So I have, I, maybe I'm in the real world and there's just no way to replace the robot in exactly the same situation that the expert demonstrator was. Okay, then I can apply a different idea and that different idea we'll call hybrid inverse RL um, based on this idea of hybrid reinforcement learning. And the idea is very simple. I'm gonna alternate again between two tasks. One, the discrimination task, which is find me cost function discriminates between what the learner does now and what the expert does. And then I'm gonna hand that reward function to my hybrid reinforcement learning algorithm. And what that hybrid reinforcement learning algorithm is going to do effectively is it's gonna run something like Q-learning. Think about an off policy learner if you're familiar with things like Q-learning. And it's going to change the replay buffer in Q-learning to a mixture of the learner itself replay buffer. So by that, I mean, think about state, action, reward. The reward comes from the discriminator step. Next state, next action. And it's going to run Q learning on that. Normally, that's what you just do. You run Q learning on the learner's own action states and actions. Now I'm going to run it on the learner states and actions and the expert states and actions. So I'm going to take 50% of my state actions from the expert itself, state action, plug in the reward, next state, next action. And I'm going to take 50% from the learner itself. Okay. Under a much stronger set of assumptions, the kind of assumptions you need to prove that Q learning actually does anything meaningful. This algorithm will also get you a polynomial number of samples to achieve performance that's competitive with the expert instead of exploring this giant tree of possibilities. Okay, that's the flavor of how do you make IRL successful? The answer is basically two things. You don't actually have to beat the, you don't actually have to find the optimal policy each step. And the way to compete with the expert is take advantage of the expert state action distribution or just state distribution and use that in your exploration. Okay. Um, this works really well, um, much better than behavior cloning, and much, much better in terms of sample complexity versus naive inverse reinforcement learning. Um, even on relatively hard benchmark problems, ant maze is kind of one of these things where you have to simultaneously control the dynamics of a walking robot, and you have to solve a maze. So it's got kind of two time scales of problem. Um, if you do a version of what I just described, you get kind of the state-of-the-art imitation learning results for these kind of problems. All right, I'm gonna wrap up there because I think I am at or over time.
Um, and I would try to summarize this idea about imitation learning as it's really hard to learn how to drive a car by just watching someone drive a car. Right? And maybe that doesn't surprise you, but you could imagine trying to do that. You can imagine sitting next to a person and just observing how they drive a car. And you're gonna learn something in that process for sure, but it turns out to be pretty essential to actually control the car yourself. Right? And you can think about the two categories of imitation learning that I just described to you as two different ways to learn while driving the car. One is there's a person next to you and they tell you, oh God, don't do that, right? That's the expert intervention, right? And they, they give you what you should do instead while you're actually driving the car. Obviously, there's uh, limitations to that approach. And the inverse reinforcement learning approach is you attempt to drive the car and you compare the outcome to what the human did, the, the expert that you were originally watching did. So you're not just trying to match their actions, you're trying to match their results and how they drive in the real world. And so that's how I would summarize the general flavor of imitation learning. Um, and as I said, this is a, a long period of work. So I have lots of people to thank, Gokul Swami, Wen Sun. I'm so thankful to Wen Sun, I thanked him twice. Um, Sanjaban Chowdhury, uh, Stefan Ross, uh, Stephen Zhu, and many other colleagues. And I will stop there and see if there's any other questions. So I, I often think of the most important learning problem as um, is you're learning a objective function and a key function, whatever you call yep. it. Yep. So that whatever you observe is given low cost, or whatever yep. you don't observe is given, is given high cost. Yep, I agree. The method that you describe, mm -hmm. uh, classify is a contrastive method. So you basically generate sure. a bad path, and then you get a higher cost on the certain thing. Yep. So again, yeah, yeah, that's our example. Uh-huh. Yep. Um, and here, uh, it is certainly, you can think about it as, as a contrastive loss for sure. Um, there is actually a probability distribution here over trajectories. And um, we are actually optimizing the, the likelihood, actually the causal log likelihood of those trajectories under the model. And certainly, you can think of that as an energy-based approach. Right. Yep. But, but it is also likelihood. So? Likelihood. Oh, yeah. Yep. But um, there may be other classes of methods, so I, um, which are not contrasting. So there's mm -hmm. the method that say, okay, you can give low cost to trajectories you observe. Yep. But here is a regular one, so they will minimize the volume of space. They can take low cost. So automatically, everything else will get higher and higher cost. Then you don't need the, to generate uh, bad trajectories anymore. Yeah, I can imagine that could be true to try to try to normalize those away. Yep. Well, it doesn't need to be privacy normalization. Yeah, un understood. Of... Something that, that pushes down the, everything else. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, yes. Yep. And uh, those methods actually work well for uh, learning teachers in a self supervised manner. Mm -hmm. Situations we can have a collapse. Uh, but I don't think they need a plan to higher else. I don't know that they have either. Um, right. So this is versions where you're not actually drawing from the current policy, so to speak. Right. I'm not aware of versions of that, but it would be interesting. And it, it's almost like inverse reinforcement learning, but it's a slightly different version of that paradigm. And no, I have not seen that version. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means I, I haven't seen it. <laughs> but, but agreed, you can imagine trying to just force the volume down so that you don't need the negative data. Yep. Yeah, I think that's true. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering about uh, IR, like how you how you do IRL in like large state and action spaces, uh -huh. where it seems like you need a very large parametric reward function to, to represent the set of rewards that you like. Say, if you think about driving, yeah. Right? What is what is the parametric reward function that we use there look like? I'm curious how you think about that. Yeah, um, it would have to be a very complex version. Right, um, you know, it, it could be a thing which is potentially on the order of the complexity of the policy itself. In those particular instances, um, this LLM version that I alluded to, um, it's a little bit complicated, but effectively, its discriminator is of the same policy class as the generator, um, and so it's a it, it's actually a transformer in that particular case. So the cost function is effectively also a transformer um, of the same size. So it's a it's a big thing in that case. Sometimes you're lucky 
And as Jan alluded to earlier, you can the reward function can be smaller, right, more compact than the policy itself. Um, that's particularly helpful if you know what matters. You just don't know how what matters combines. Like you know what matters is collisions are bad, and you know what matters is driving off the road is bad, and you know all these things, but you don't know exactly how to trade these things off. How important are those versus progress versus other metrics? So. I think it can vary depending on the problem. Sometimes they're sometimes they can be really compact and sometimes they're really big. But either way, you get these other benefits. Hopefully you get the sample complexity benefit if you can squeeze down the, the, the reward function. I think there's some evidence that reward functions, even in these complicated cases, can often be simpler than the policies themselves. Like even in a language model case, I think there's some evidence that the learned reward functions can come from simpler models than the policies. So this is kind of along a similar vein to balancing different types of error. Yep. So when both of the other we discuss yep. um, kind of take error into account. One of them has to correct error and the other ones um, has to involve error in the demonstrator or else it's not learnable. So how do you kind of decide what degree of error that you allow for? Like when you correct the learner, or uh, how much error you allow in the demonstrator, like especially when each type of error has like varying degrees of recoverability. Yeah, um, I didn't spend any time on the kind of continuous versions of these problems, so I was thinking about just the discrete versions. In which case, for any discrete error, I'm imagining that you are providing, for instance, that feedback, right? So you know, if there's a discrete set of ways to steer, anything that's wrong, you would provide that feedback for. Obviously, the learner can generalize between different discrete steering angles, for instance. Um, so I guess my answer would be, at least in the cases I'm thinking of, you would always provide the feedback, right? Um, but you would expect, for instance, your reward function to demonstrate some smoothness. So for instance, nearby paths will tend to have similar rewards, right? And that, that's going to be a property of whatever your class of learning algorithm is, right? How it tends to... Um, how it tends to smooth over states or states and actions. Um, given that you might pass, like, if you have a situation where you have very bad um, expert information and you're trying to, to like do something with something which has lots of partial observability in the environment itself, uh -huh. uh, without a lot of examples of how state kind of modifies itself when states are hidden, how does how do any of these systems? Acknowledge that. Like, I'd assume that the hidden states kind of explode exponentially when you haven't seen a lot of what might be happening as time goes on. Um, can you give me a concrete instance of what you have in mind? So, for example, if you're, yeah, perfect. Uh, if you're like learning to drive on the city street and then you like put a car on the road and yep. have a car driving by, um, cars have flying spots for like other yep. cars, how do you estimate that without having, like, you've learned kind of an a perfect example of it, but you've never seen what happens when information is hidden. Can you eventually hide that during training or? Yeah, so one of the more common techniques that I was alluding, alluding to by this learning by cheating is um, it's a two-stage process. So the first stage is learned using perfect information, right? Perfect information in the simulator. Um, meaning, for instance, you could see the cars that would actually be occluded to the, to the vehicle, for instance. Right? You know where all the other vehicles are on the environment. Um, perhaps you even know what they intend to do in the future. Right? That's the some versions of these papers assume that kind of knowledge. Um, and you learn a policy that's optimal according to that. Right? And there are multiple ways you could do that. You could learn it from human demonstration. You could learn that policy. You could learn that policy by reinforcement learning in that simulator. And then they go through the second stage of distilling that policy into something that can handle partial observability. Okay, and this is where the on policy part really makes a difference, right? Because as we alluded to before, if you try to do supervised learning on something with some hidden state, you'll often see these pretty catastrophic errors, like the, um, I'm going to ignore all my sensor data, but once I step on the brake, I'm just gonna keep stepping on the brake, or I'm just gonna spin in circles. Um, so it's the second stage where the partial observability often comes in, in these. In the distilling stage, now the expert is this learned policy, learned on a perfect system, and it's providing what the correct thing to do is in that situation. But the learner only gets input of, for instance, the sensor data that it has, including the occlusions, 
right? Um, and then it tries to do as well as it can given that information. And so that's typically how you see partial observability kind of built into these problems. I'm not saying that's the only way, um, but it's surprising how many recent robotics papers look like train a thing with privileged information and in simulation, distill it down to something that doesn't have privileged information, and then execute that thing in the real world. Still, it on policy so it doesn't have that privilege. So does yeah. the policy just become something akin to like a world model in this case? Um, it must be internally doing some world modeling because it's taking kind of sequences of information, sequences of observations typically over time, right? So it's taking frames of camera data rather than a single camera data. It's building some internal state based on that. That's usually a, um, that's not usually a supervised internal state. It's just whatever internal state will ultimately deliver the right uh, actions in the world. But presumably what it's doing is building some internal model that's going on in the world. Well, taking advantage of the extra trajectory, maybe yeah. Maybe can you bias the output of the algorithm so much on that one particular trajectory, or not? Do we want that one bias? Do we want to analyze that extra trajectory so much? Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair question, and there are trade offs. Um, so, right. So, the theoretical versions of these algorithms. The first one in particular actually only requires I draw samples at all from the expert demonstration. So it says, draw your initial states, not just from the true initial state of the IRL algorithm, but draw your states from where the expert went, right? And in fact, only where the expert went. Okay, um, that, uh, that brings up the concern you just described is that you have really forced the solution very narrowly to be prescribed to be what the expert did, even if there are similar reward behaviors that the learner can learn more easily. Like for instance, I gave this example of there's two ways to get to the goal. One goes across the narrow bridge. The learner goes across the narrow bridge. If you only draw samples from along the narrow bridge, you can't learn the policy that goes around the other way, right? So you are in fact biased in that case. Um, so that is a real problem. Um, and in fact, you will see compounding errors for real if you draw it only that way. So in practice, what we do is we draw from both distributions. We draw from the learner itself and the expert distribution. And that allows the learner to find, it, it may take a long time. It may then require exponential samples to find the other way around, right? But it at least has the ability to learn both things. It can learn the suboptimal way of walking along the cliff and it falls off sometimes. And it can learn the other way, right? By virtue of both Kinds. Um, it definitely biases the solution. So you get uh, potentially exponentially less global exploration at the price of your solution is more biased towards the particular actions chosen by the expert rather than just matching the expert's reward. Yep. That is a real price. What I'm struggling with is that particular example. Yeah. If you took the lower route, yep. your distance to the goal is getting longer by the initially. Correct. And so you will never be able, you will pay for that. You will never be able to perfectly match the expert if you go that way, but you'll get as close as you can. So you'll try to get your distance. Imagine the only cost under consideration is distance or if you fall off the cliff, basically two costs, right? And it's just the sum of those two things. But if you start going down that route, the cost keeps going up. So how would you know that's the right way to go? Um, and supposing that was an infinite wall that went all the way down. Well, if it's an infinite wall, you're out of luck, right, right? right? You'll never find it. But imagine it's a finite wall for a moment. Okay. okay. And now I'm calling a reinforcement learning oracle. Okay. And that reinforcement learning oracle is going to find the best path it can, given my limitations. My limitation is every once in a while, I choose the wrong action, right? So 5% of the time, I just choose a random action. That's Take that as the simplest version of I have some limitation on my output, right? A reinforcement learning algorithm at great computational sample expense can find that other way. Think about it, the worst case, it enumerates all possible paths and then picks the best one, right? So that's the, that is the trade-off, is that IRL thing is potentially trying all possible paths to the goal at great expense to say, okay, I can't quite match the expert because I go a longer route, but I do much better than going the way the expert does across the narrow path, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so there is this real trade-off between this kind of global exploration where you could find a totally alternate route and the try to match exactly the behavior of the expert. That, that is a real trade-off when you have an imperfect learner. So maybe last question before we finish. Uh, what yes. are the challenges, the open questions that you see for the future that you'd like to address? That's an excellent question that I should have pondered in advance. <laughs> um, there are many challenges on that front. Um, Jan alluded to one, which is, you know, are there algorithms that don't even bother to do the kind of negative sampling? That's a kind of interesting challenge. Um, I think the... A lot of these algorithms only work in simulation and then they still require a fairly large number of interactions with the environment, right? Um, that's pretty typical. In fact, almost all the examples I gave you of robotics applications, for better or for worse, look like the learning was done in simulation. In fact, it was this two-stage process typically, right? The learning was done in simulation um, in a privileged way with privileged information. And then the distillation was done in simulation. And then the policy was deployed in the real world. And the reason for that is because it has to do a lot of samples and simulation, right? I would say for all of these approaches, they're still particularly the inverse reinforcement learning ones, um, they are still particularly expensive to deploy without access to something like simulation. So one might argue that the small training data regime is the interesting regime, which I think is not well understood. So, yeah. So in, in, in imitation learning, we see that uh, the agent tries to learn what the expert is doing. So in other, other words, it, it means that the upper bound of the performance of the agent is tied to how the expert is or how right the expert is. So in this terms, um, isn't it so in, in driving? Uh, so the expert demonstration is that of the basically a human? Uh -huh. So does it does it not mean that the upper bound of performance for an imitation learning agent is a human? Yeah, there's two answers to that question. Um, first off, in the driving domain, what limits humans is not typically their ability. If you have a highly trained driver, it's their ability to pay attention. Right. So you're not actually typically limited. Humans are, are typically excellent drivers if you have a well-trained commercial driver and you have um, and you know they're paying attention. Right. And there are ways to help ensure multiple drivers, et cetera, looking at the data and only picking data where you're very confident the driver is really paying attention. That means your upper bound is the performance of drivers who are acting far better than um, the typical human driver. They're never distracted by definition because you're looking at data where they're never distracted, et cetera. So your upper bound is much higher than you would think. Um, it's also true, although I didn't go into it here, that you can imagine the inequality version of the inverse reinforcement learning algorithms where you don't, you don't demand that you equal the performance of the human expert, but you demand that you have an inequality, that you are at least as good as the human expert and you could be better, right? Typically you need to know the sign of your cost function in that case, meaning you have to know that something is either good or bad, like very easy version, collisions are bad, right? You always want it to be the case that collisions are expensive. So you always want to have fewer collisions than a human, right? In that case, you know the sign of a particular part of the cost function. If you know the sign, inverse reinforcement learning algorithms can exceed the performance of their demonstrator because they enforce the inequality constraint, right? Do as well as you can, do at least as well as the expert. Uh, let's sign the speaker one more time. Oh, but thank you. Remember us and maybe oh, it's lovely. We can stand for a photo. So sounds um, great. Thank you all very much for the invitation. All right. Thank you so much. This is lovely. <laughs> Thank you.
Great. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. A little, a little scattered. Like I said, it's been a long time since I've done that.